Let's go to our Bible study for today. Go to the book of Hebrews, chapter 8. Hebrews 8. We're going to take up verses 7 through 13 today, but first, I want to review. We spent a couple of weeks in chapter 7 noticing the differences and the similarities between Melchizedek and the Lord Jesus Christ. Melchizedek was said to be a priest of uh, Salem, meaning a, pre, pre, a, a king of Salem, rather, which meant king of peace. And the city Jerusalem means the city of peace. Solomon means uh, peace. Um, and But Melchizedek was not Jesus Christ in some sort of Old Testament preview, like a lot of people suppose. It says, but he was made like unto the Son of God, chapter 7, verse 3. And Christ is said to be made an high priest after the order of Melchizedek, in chapter 6, verse 20. Chapter 7, verse 3 also said Melchizedek abode a priest continually, whereas Christ's priesthood continueth ever and is unchangeable, chapter 7, verse 24, and that he ever liveth to make intercession for the sinner, verse 25. And I pointed out the subtle differences between the words continual and continuous. They're often thought of as perfect synonyms with each other, but they're not. Continual means something happens over and over again at intervals. Stop and start, stop and start. And uh, Melchizedek's priesthood was said to be a continual priesthood. But continuous means it goes on and on, it never stops. There's no break. There's no interruption. And that is the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He continueth ever and is unchangeable, verse 24, and he ever liveth to make intercession for the sinner, verse 25. Uh, verse, notice chapter 7, verse 12. It said, For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. And a change of the law means a change in the sacrifice. <clears throat> Excuse me. Since the Lord Jesus Christ was without sin, he never had to offer an animal for his sins at the uh, altar of the Levites in the temple. You never read about the Lord Jesus going to the temple to uh, make sacrifice for his sins, because he had none. Um, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmity, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin, chapter 4, verse 15. So he never had to make an offering of an animal for his sins. And since the Creator himself, Colossians 1, 16, John 1, verse 3, since the Creator himself is going to be greater than his creation, he offered himself as a sacrifice for sins and for sinners. Uh, he was greater than the animals. Here's the the thing that bears repeating, it's such a simple matter once you consider it, and yet it's missed by so many. God told man, or Adam, uh, not Adam, but God instituted the system of animal sacrifice. Actually, it did begin in the garden. Um, God slew an animal to cover the nakedness of Adam and Eve, and then Abel's offerings were, off, or were accepted by God. He brought the first things of his flock. Uh, where Cain simply brought fruits and vegetables. But, so the, God instituted the system of offering a, a sacrifice of an animal to cover your sin every time you sin. But it would, it would forgive that sin at that time, but it wouldn't erase it from your record. And the next time you sin, you had to bring another offering. So, what, now if... Um, if salvation comes, let's say, I'm just going to use their, them as an example. In the Roman Catholic system, they believe that the priest takes the, the wafer and the wine. He says the words of transubstantiation, uh, this is my body, this is my blood. Uh, then he holds it up after he's supposedly blessed it and says, this is Jesus, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. 
And I've witnessed this thousands of times now in my job at the funeral business. In the back of my mind, I'm thinking, how can you be so <laughs> foolish as to think that? But uh, they believe that Jesus is offered repeatedly on their altar in the form of a bread and wine. And then when the priest breaks that wafer in front of the people, he is effectively breaking the body of Jesus once again. He is crucifying Jesus again. Uh, in the form of bread and wine. Uh, and so he is, Jesus Christ's uh, sacrifice is repeated continually every day. But if, if his sacrifice needs to be repeated over and over again, then his sacrifice was no more effective than the animals were before that. What man needed was a sacrifice that was not only equal to the animals, but far greater than the animals, the Creator Himself. And so, in dying, God in human form, in the Lord Jesus, dying for the sinner, His death was sufficient to cover the guilt of all sins, of all sinners for all time. And um, that's, that's a distinction that's not clearly made, but it's simple when you think about it, that one priest uh, lives eternally, the other, he, he undoubtedly died somewhere along the way, Melchizedek did. The Bible doesn't give us the details of his life and where he came from, but he appears, and Abraham gives him tithes, recognizing him as greater with God than he was. God told Abraham, I'm going to separate you, and your people are going to become a great nation, and yet Abraham himself recognized someone who had higher authority with God than he did. And um, Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, and by association, the Levites also gave uh, honor to Melchizedek as a greater priest, even though they, the Levite priesthood hadn't been instituted yet. But uh, Levi was in the loins, as the Bible says, in the genes, the genetics of Abraham, waiting to be born one day. And that priesthood of the Levites was inferior to the priesthood that Melchizedek had. But Melchizedek didn't live eternally. His sacrifices were continual, not continuous. And so in that respect, Jesus was like Melchizedek, but greater than Melchizedek. And so what man needed was a sacrifice that would be equal to the animals and far greater than the animals. So God himself came into the world, suffered for, sake, for sins and for sinners. That was the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, to offer the sacrifice that would never need to be repeated again. And I said to you, I think, last time, if Christ's death isn't all-sufficient one time, it'll never be all-sufficient, no matter how many times it's redone, reenacted, no matter how many times it's repeated. And um, the eternal sacrifice, the never-changing sacrifice, uh, the continuous sacrifice, is that of the Lord Jesus. Look forward at chapter 10. Read a couple of verses we looked at before. Chapter 10, and notice what it says, verse 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Verse 12, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, comma, sat down on the right hand of God. Verse 14, for by one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. And look back at verse 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. And yet what did John the Baptist say about the Lord Jesus? John 1, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. Chapter 10, verse 12 says that this man, meaning Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, comma, sat down on the right hand of God. The old um, Catholic Douay Confraternity Bible, published in, I think, 1582, it reads almost exactly like the King James Bible reads. But it says, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, comma, forever sat down on the right hand of God. They move that comma back eight spaces, and by simply moving the comma, 
they open the door for future sacrifices at the hands of a priest. But they also make a contradiction in their theology because the rest of the verse then reads, he forever sat down at the right hand of God. And yet in the Apostles' Creed, it says, um, Christ is seated at the right hand of God, from whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. Well, if he's seated at the right hand of God forever, he can't come back then, can he? So they create a contradiction in their own theology by simply fooling around with the Bible. <laughs> All they did was move a comma, eight spaces, or seven spaces, and by that little um, move, maneuver, they, they made Christ's death be uh, uh, insufficient once and for all, and they also contradict their own stated beliefs. But we looked at that before. Now, let's go back to chapter 8. Let's read verses 7 through 13. And it says, For it is, excuse me, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with him, he saith, Behold, the day is come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind, and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, uh, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now he, excuse me, now that which decayeth and waxes old is ready to vanish away. To begin, notice the, the covenant which is about to be established is with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And you might remember those were the two kingdoms the whole household of, of Israel split into. Ten tribes separated to the north uh, after a Rehoboam, Solomon's son, perverted everything. Um, and two tribes to the south. The southern kingdom was called the kingdom of Judah. It consisted of the tribe of Judah and uh, the Levites were the priests there. And I think Benjamin was there. And the other uh, tribes, the other ten tribes, constituted the kingdom of Israel to the north. And they mixed in with Samaritans and adopted idolatry and began to set up idols and images and uh, worshiping the host of heaven, that is the stars and the planets and everything they saw in the night sky, all of those things. Um, <clears throat> there was never a good king over the kingdom of Israel. There were good and bad kings in the southern kingdom of Judah. One good king would be succeeded by his son who was a bad king. And up and down, up and down the graph would go. But the covenant which is about to be established is to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah, according to verse 8. It is not with the quote-unquote elect, according to John Calvin or Calvinism. Calvinism's idea is that since God knows everything, God knows who will be saved, it must mean that God has decided who will be saved and who will not be saved. And this developed into the, what they call their two eternal decrees. Long before God made the, the earth, Genesis 1, he had decided already who he would save and who he would not save. Before he even made man, he already had decided which ones he would redeem and save, which ones he would not save. So that when men were eventually born, they had ultimately no free will, no decision-making power in the, in the operation at all. So they're simply acting out uh, parts in the script that God has written for them ahead of time. All of us are doing that, according to Calvinism. John Calvin said nothing happens except by the de eternal decree of God uh, so that you and I are, really have no free will. If you feel guilty for your sins and you turn to Jesus Christ and you ask him to become your savior and ask God to forgive you, it's because God had foreordained and chosen you to be saved. And if you're 
if you're not one of the chosen and you make some gesture like that, you're not going to get saved or born no matter what you do. Because it's already been decided ahead of time. That's the stupid, idiotic idea of Calvinism. But it's the covenant will not be to the elect. And the covenant that God's going to make is not with the church in whatever variety it's in, whether it's the Church of England, the Catholic Church, um, the different Protestant denominations and different charismatic groups, or the so-called church, whatever that means, some universal term, it won't be with the church. It is not with the Israel of God, those who... Um, remember Herbert W. Armstrong, Worldwide Church of God? He claimed that British Israelism, or Anglo-Israelism, that, Israelism, that white people from Europe uh, inherit all the blessings given to the Jews in the Old Testament. And uh, um, Ephraim and Manasseh represented Great Britain, England, and the United States. And all the blessings given to the Jews under those names were actually intended for white people who inhabited uh, the United States and Great Britain. Good luck finding many of those in Great Britain these days, right? <laughs> Go there. See how many Muslims are taking over London. They got a, the mayor of London is a Muslim. They've, got, they've had beheadings on the streets of London. They didn't used to have that before the Muslims moved in. Muslims are out to kill you. Well, they might be... Well, the guy that I work with, Brother Shrive, he's not like that. Yeah, but he belongs to the same religion that is like that. And I'd run in the opposite direction if I thought my reputation would be tarnished by a bunch of ISIS or so-called fighters, Al-Qaeda, or whatever their name is for them this week. Muhammad was a barbarian and a warrior and taught his people that that's how the kingdom of Allah is to be spread, by force, domination. Murder those who don't submit and don't believe. And dominate those you choose to keep alive, dominate them and make them pay an extra tax just for the privilege of living in your country. If I had to choose between the state of Israel and any Muslim-dominated country, I'd be an idiot if I didn't choose Israel. But uh, Anglo-Israelism is not, uh, they are not the inheritors of the benefit beneficiaries of God's blessings to Israel and to Judah. Uh, God's new covenant will not be with the Roman Catholic institution worldwide. Uh, it is not with the spiritual Jews, like professing Christians, who say God is all finished blessing the Jewish people, the genetic, physical descendants of Abraham, any longer. They have no more claim to God's blessings, all those that are somehow, somehow spiritually transferred to Christians living today. That's not so. God's covenant uh, will not be with the Jehovah's Witnesses. What a ridiculous operation JWs are. Here's a, here's a way to you ever try to witness to a JW and offer them a track? They don't want to take it. I've, I've offered a track to JWs, tracks to J, and uh, they have this little reaction. They say, well, we, they put their hands up like this. They say, well, we believe we have the truth, and so we don't want to corrupt our understanding with something that we don't accept. Pick up any copy of the Watchtower magazine. In fact, if they have them and they're trying to force one on you, say, let me show you something. Go through the Watchtower magazine and they have all kinds of articles there um, expo uh, com comparing their beliefs with the beliefs of Catholicism, with the beliefs of Protestantism. They, they recite reference works. They cite Christian encyclopedias. They, they cite Christian authors to use uh, as, you know, information in their articles to try to make their case. Evidently, somebody back at JW headquarters has the freedom to read other people's books and write these articles, but not the dumb sap on the street passing out their literature. You're not allowed to do that. Point that out to them sometime and say, why aren't you allowed to read other works that might reflect on the truth of God and, and uh, these people are? You ever notice uh, in any JW magazine, they never print the name of the author who wrote the article. 
They put the article, there's never an author who wrote it. That's to protect the guilty. <laughs> um, I mean, who wants to lay claim to that? You know, when you die, you just go to sleep and lay in the cemetery to some future uh, awakening. That's what JWs believe, that soul sleep, your body goes, your soul goes unconscious, lays there dormant in your body, in the casket, or in some ethereal form if you're cremated, and in the grave, in the cemetery, it's laying there inside the body, a dormant and asleep, and is aware of nothing until God calls for you one day, and they justify it saying, uh, it might be centuries of time go by from the death of someone who, uh, until God calls them forth, but it'll only seem like a moment. Well, that's all make, it's all fiction. They have made all that up. Find me a verse that would justify any of that. But they believe that. Seventh-day Adventists teach that. And this other sort of an offshoot JW called the Christadelphians, they teach that. When you die, your soul goes unconscious and lays there in the grave somewhere. And I work in the funeral business. I've been doing this for 32 years, almost 33 years. And I've heard JW ministers at the cemeteries talk about the person lying here until the great brother, their soul lying there in the grave until God calls them forth. How hopeless is that? There's no hope in that. There's no comfort in that. Paul says, um, Paul says, uh, then we which are alive shall, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. It says, then which sleep in Jesus. So they take that word sleep and they interpret it literally that the soul goes to sleep and is aware of nothing happening outside. It goes to sleep in the grave, but it's a metaphor. It's a euphemism. Uh, it's, a, it's a figure of speech to represent the death of somebody. Then that sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him? Well, God can't bring them with him if they're not with him. So the idea that you just lie there, you know, unconscious for centuries in the grave is a lot of hogwash. But um, the covenant God's going to make will not be with the JWs. Uh, it's not going to be with the Seventh-day Adventist or Seventh-day Baptist. It's because they, you know, um, are vegetarian and they have a certain dietary code that they think represents the Jews' dietary rules. Jews were allowed to eat meat. Why aren't the Adventists? I mean, can you imagine how, how many like the, good, the smell of a good barbecue? Don't you know the whole camp of Israel smelled like that <laughs> when the Levites were offering uh, bulls and lambs on the altar? My wife was watching something about the Pavlov's experiments with dogs. They give the dog meat and they ring a bell. Give them meat again, ring a bell, and every time they'd hear the bell, they start to salivate thinking meat was on the way. They were conditioned. I'd like to smell uh, outdoor barbecue seven days a week. But I like the uh, L.A. Carby. I like that. I like the Korean barbecue. That smells good. Basically, I like any kind of meat. But God's covenant won't be with Seventh-day Adventists or Seventh-day Baptists, but it will be with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, the literal Jews. This future covenant produces several unique um, results. Notice the laws of God, first of all, the laws of God end up in the hearts and the minds of a nation of people whose ancestors murdered the Messiah when he first came. Go back, if you will, to the book of Matthew, chapter 21. I'm trying to move along here. Matthew 21. And let's begin there at verse 21. Let's begin there at verse 37. Matthew 21, verse 37. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. When the Lord, therefore, of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? 
They say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men, and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus saith unto, uh, excuse me, Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard the, his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. Go also to the book of Acts chapter 7. Acts 7, let's look at verses 51 and 52. The apostle Peter says, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them, which showed before of the coming of the just one, meaning Christ, of whom... Ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. That was the guilt of the nation of Israel when the Lord Jesus came. And 1 Thessalonians 2. Let's go over there. 1 Thessalonians 2. First Thessalonians 2, notice there verse 15. Who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, excuse me, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men. Here's Paul, uh, trained as a Pharisee, speaking of his own countrymen, and the guilt that they had as a collective nation in rejecting their own Savior. Uh, in contrast, uh, to the preaching of the gospel, God says, verse 10 today, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. When Peter talked about an uncircumcised heart, uncircumcised ear, the Bible mentions that in a number of places. An uncircumcised heart means a heart that's unwilling to receive what God wants to give. An uncircumcised ear is an ear that's unwilling to hear and listen to what God wants to say. And that's how the Apostle Peter described the nation of Israel. It must be a very agonizing thing to, rec to, to reconcile in your own mind, being, having been raised a Jew. Remember when God said to Peter, Rise, Peter, kill and eat? He said, Not so, Lord, for nothing unclean has ever come into my mouth. And, uh, and yet, to admit the guilt of his own countrymen, his fellow Jews, his ancestors, his family members who rejected the Messiah when he showed up. What do they say about the Lord Jesus? When the Messiah show, uh, cometh, shall he do more miracles than this man doeth? And the answer was a rhetorical question, no. And yet they still, as a collective nation, rejected him. But And then second, the second uh, result that can come from this new covenant, God will convert every living Jew, not the so-called spiritual Jews, as it were, we're Jews by, you know, a similar faith, but who uh, composes the house of Israel and the house of Judah, according to verse 11. None of them will have to testify or witness about the gospel or the plan of salvation or anything like it, verse 11. They shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me. It seems too fantastic to imagine now, but then it won't be because the Word of God says it will happen. That's all you need to know. Uh, if the Bible says that something's going to happen, I promise you, it's going to happen. I was listening to... Uh, that Calvary Chapel radio show, people call in with their questions and ask the 
Calvary Chapel pastors who are babes in the Word of God to answer their question for them. And the guy called up and asked the question, uh, if God if God changes his mind about something, I forget it had to, I forget the exact details of his question, but it had to do with God changing his mind from time to time, and they assured him, no, God doesn't change his mind. Uh, God said, um, and I wanted to call in and right at that moment say, well, God told Jonah to go preach to the city of Nineveh because he's getting ready to wipe them out. And Jonah preached, and God stayed his hand and didn't judge Nineveh. Uh, wasn't that a change of God's mind? Later on, we read that God eventually did bring judgment to the city of Nineveh. But he simply postponed his actions based upon their res response to jo uh, Jonah's <clears throat> preaching. <clears throat> Doesn't mean he's not... If he stated something that's going to happen, he stated in his book, there's no alteration of his plan. He may postpone it, he may do it right away, but that's, in his, that's his doing. <clears throat> but um, <clears throat> it seems too fantastic now to think that all Jews living on the world, in the world at that time, will embrace the Messiah, will embrace the Lord Jesus Christ as the Messiah. The Bible said they should look upon me whom they have pierced. The Old Testament. But uh, go, if you will, to the book of Isaiah, chapter 11. Now I'm kind of dragging my feet here. I apologize. Let's move along. Isaiah 11. And notice there, Isaiah 11, verses 8 and 9. And the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice. Yeah, those are two names for venomous snakes of different kinds. But, and they, that is the animals, the wild animals, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord and of the waters cover the sea. Go forward to Isaiah 54. Isaiah 54, let's start here at verse 11. O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest. Uh, by the way, that's where you get that phrase, the bring the huddled masses, so forth, yearning to be free, the tempest tossed to me, that poem about the Statue of Liberty, the tempest, those are, those are people tossed back and forth on the ocean waves in a, in a boat. They're, they're tossed by the tempest. The Bible's full of phrases like that that end up in literature later on. Thou afflicted, tossed with tempest, and not comforted, behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors, lay thy foundations with sapphires, and I will make thy windows of agates, and thy gates of carbuncles, and all thy borders of pleasant stones, and all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31. And look at verses 33 and 34. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. That's the text uh, Paul's quoting, referring to in uh, Hebrews 8. Uh, if they do presume to prophesy or speak for God, <clears throat> then they're to be executed. They're to be put to death because it won't be necessary when that time comes. Go back, if you will, to the book of Zechariah. <clears throat> Zechariah 13 And verses 2 and 3. That's to start at verse 1. Zechariah 13, verses 1 to 3. 
In that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered. And also I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. And it shall come to pass that when any shall yet prophesy, then his father and his mother that begat him shall say unto him, Thou shalt not live. But thou speakest lies in the name of the Lord. And his father and his mother that begat him shall thrust him through when he prophesieth. It won't be necessary to prophesy because everyone will know and believe God and the Son of God will be seated on a throne in Jerusalem ruling over the literal earth in his kingdom. And anyone that presumes to speak on, on behalf of God contrary to the universal knowledge of Jesus Christ uh, will be put to death. It won't be necessary. Right now we, he, and you can't spiritualize this and say, well, that's talking about everyone knowing, hearing the gospel. From the least to the greatest, do not all believe the gospel of Jesus Christ today, but they will then. And then the third result that can come from this future covenant, he says their sins and their iniquities, verse 12, will be forgotten. God says he will remember no more their unrighteousness. What a day that will be. Um, that happens the moment a sinner turns to the Lord Jesus Christ. Every sin he ever committed up to that time is forgiven. His record is washed clean. And he is no more bound for a future of judgment in hell because of the sins he ever committed. God sees them no more. They're, they're covered by the cleansing agent of the, the blood of Jesus Christ by faith. It's a spiritual operation. I was talking to these two Catholic nuns last week, and I said, the only way of someone coming to be reconciled with God is a spiritual operation. God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, John 4, 24. But like I said earlier, they, they knew the little Bible and were not interested in the Bible, which I was actually surprised to glean that from them. But lastly today, let's read verse 13 again in our text. <clears throat> in that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. The writer is clearly aiming his comments or his remarks at the Jews in the tribulation who have sought to return to a priestly sacrificial system of worship once again. And uh, Peter said that the old system was a yoke which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear, Acts uh, 15, verse 10. And his comments were only concerning circumcision. Even keeping that was a chore. The Lord Jesus pointed this out. Uh, every male baby was to be circumcised on the eighth day after birth. But if that eighth day happened to fall upon a Sabbath day, what were they going to do? Would they keep one commandment and violate the other? or keep the one and violate the first one, which they do. This, this offered a real a conundrum, a problem for them. What do we do? Let's just hope your kid's born, you know, on a Tuesday or a Wednesday and not, and not born on the preceding uh, Saturday, on the previous Saturday, but uh, or Friday, whatever the case may be. And um, <coughs> so he said, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. And uh, the sad part is that the Jews will, in the tribulation, will trust the Antichrist to enable them to return to these sacrifices, the sacrificial system. They've been without the temple since 70 AD and no animal sacrifices um, afforded to them. After years of being dispersed and kicked from pillar to post and scattered around the world, no Jew today knows exactly which tribe he's descended from. And because of that, uh, the, the people like that jerk Anderson over in uh, Arizona who say God's all finished with the Jew. Jews don't even know which tribe they come from. Yeah, but does that mean God doesn't know? What, didn't, didn't God say, who is he that contendeth with his maker, with the Almighty? Who are you to second-guess God and try to rewrite the Bible and say it doesn't mean what it says on the page. But 
and uh, it will be a he will be under a Sabbath observing system. Matthew 24 verse 20. Pray that your flight be not on the Sabbath day. It will be a temple worshiping system. Matthew 24 15. The abomination of desolation stand in the holy place. So that will be restored. That will be rebuilt. It will be geographically in the land of Palestine, Matthew 24, verse 16. Let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. And it will be a system of commandment keeping set up. Revelation 22, 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life. And all of that has nothing to do with the believer in the church age now. So you can't spiritualize all these promises and say, well, they're ours to claim by faith uh, in a figurative sense or a symbolic sense. Dr. Ruckman, if he did nothing else for me, was to cause me to say, to, to believe the Bible is perfect just as it is. Every single word that's there is the word God intends to be there. Every word in the vocabulary is the word he wants me to learn in order to describe what I'm reading. It's not my place to change a, a word. It's not my place to even change the punctuation. Leave the periods and the commas and the question marks um, and the colons and semicolons right where they are. It's not my place to change a single jot or tittle, as it would be said, called, in the scriptures. My job is to believe it. And as I said before, um, it's not my job to change the Bible. The Bible's job is to change me. And I think this simple fact gets forgotten by so many. And so it's such a simple proposition to believe it exactly as you're reading it. To think if God could write a book, would it have any mistakes in it at all? No. If God could provide a book to the world, put it in the hands of the world, in the universal language of the world, there are more people studying China as a second language in China than there are native English speakers in all of Europe. That's how many people who live in China. Every Korean student taught English as well in school besides growing up in Korean. You all want to come to Southern California, right? Have some L.A. carving with Pastor Shrive. And I wish they'd bring it a little more often too, by the way. But, um, but, but there are more people speaking English in other parts of the world than any. It wasn't my doing. And I had nothing to do with it. I happened to be born in an English-speaking country, in an English-speaking state. And uh, Brother Andrew was talking to Sister Hannah earlier in Korean, greeting each other. And I say, hey, this is California, my friend. You speak Spanish like the rest of us. <laughs> and, um, we're going to stop right there. <laughs> and uh, we'll, need to, <laughs> we'll need to come back to this for a little bit more follow-up next time and then move on to chapter 9, God willing. But there's coming a covenant, there's coming a day when the Jews will turn to the Lord Jesus as their Messiah, the one their ancestors had rejected, the one their ancestors had crucified and refused to believe and to follow. It's hard to imagine the sense of guilt and shame that will overwhelm the hearts and minds of a lot of Jewish people when that time comes, thinking that the one our family and our rabbis told us to reject was the one we should have received centuries ago. But they'll all turn to the Lord Jesus when he says, the fullness of the Gentiles become in, uh, Romans eleven twenty five. then all Israel shall be saved. Not every individual Jew that's ever lived, but all Israel at that time with the age of the Gentiles is over uh, and all Israel will be saved.